In recent years, more and more academics and activists have been using the term global apartheid, drawing an analogy between the infamous system of white minority rule in South Africa and the international order that we live in today. To many, this analogy can sound shocking and outlandish. But in this short video, I will point to a few major similarities that not only challenge the story that we are being told about the world, but point also to the type of systemic change that we need. The essence of the argument is that the same formula that underlined the apartheid system in South Africa of economic integration of the population and political segregation characterizes also the existing world order, where humanity as a whole is economically integrated by the global market, but politically and legally divided and segregated. To understand the analogy and the similarities, let me start with a quick review of how this formula was applied in South Africa. There, the economic integration meant that whites and blacks played different roles, but in the same economy. The whites were the owners and the managers of the businesses, while the blacks had to do all the dirty, hard work for a lousy payment, but as part of the same business or corporation. The gap in their status and their different roles in that integrated economy resulted from the second part of the apartheid formula, which was their political segregation into separate legal systems. White people only were counted as citizens of South Africa, whose rights were protected by the rule of law and could participate democratically in the national decision-making. The blacks were politically excluded, but the way they were excluded is of particular importance. The white government declared 10 remote areas as states of the blacks, each supposedly belonging to a different tribe. Each black person in South Africa, regardless of where they actually lived, was no longer a citizen of South Africa, but of one of those new fictitious homelands. Thus, the blacks of South Africa suddenly found themselves in the status of foreigners in their own country, with no citizens' rights and under a strict regime of movement control, surveillance, and constant risk of deportation. The white government tried to tell the world that these so-called black homelands were self-governed and autonomous nation-states. They even tried to brand them as Bantu states, where the word Bantu means people in some of the local African languages. But everyone knew that these were nothing but puppet states, whose corrupt black leadership had to obey the white government or be removed and punished. Cynically, people started calling them Bantu stans, the word stan means state or land in many Asian languages. And just as everyone knew at the time of the Cold War that Kazakhstan or Uzbekistan were not controlled by the Kazakh people or the Uzbek people, but by the Soviet Union, so it was clear that the Bantu states or the Bantu stans were engineered and controlled by the whites. But ridiculous as these Bantu stans were, they were extremely efficient in fulfilling their true purpose, which was to legally divide and rule the black population. This way, the white minority enjoyed the best of both worlds. By integrating with the blacks only economically, the whites made sure that they wouldn't have to do all the hard work in the mines and the fields or even clean their own homes. And by excluding the blacks politically, the whites got to have a democracy just for themselves. Now, when we zoom out to the global level, what do we see? We have a huge economic global integration, in the sense that economic activities of multinational corporations span the entire earth, right? Almost every single product that we wear, that we eat, that we use, relies on this global economic integration. And, like in South Africa, People around the world play very different roles and get very different compensation in that economically integrated system. And what determines for most of them their place on the ladder, to a great degree, 
is not their personal talent or diligence, but what is their nationality, and on which side of the border they happen to stand. If they are citizens of some Western country, which is just a nicer way for saying mostly white country, most chances, statistically, are that they stand much higher on the global social economic ladder than most of the citizens of the non-European, non-white countries. It is true that there are many exceptions, but on average, and in comparison to the majority of the world, white people enjoy much better education, health services, and public infrastructures. Their environment is much less polluted, and their working conditions are by far superior. Take, just for example, the border between the state of California in the USA and Mexico. On the Californian side of the fence, it is not legal to pay a worker less than $13 an hour. That is the minimum legal wage. On the Mexican side, the minimum wage equals just one US dollar per hour. What a gap! It means that even for doing exactly the same work, just by being on Californian soil, a worker will get a salary that is 13 times bigger than his fellow worker that stands on Mexican soil. So, despite the huge economic integration of the world, and despite the ecological unity of the Earth, national borders legally divide humanity to some 200 separate jurisdictions, where the rights and liberties of the people who work for us in the same business or the same corporation can be of entirely different order. In other words, under the international system, what determines your place on the ladder, at least formally, is not the color of your skin or the shape of your eyes or nose, oh no, no, but the color of the passport that you have, or the colors of the flag under which you happen to be born. And this point raises two important questions. First, if we think today that racism is inherently wrong, that it is a bad thing to treat a person differently just on the account of something as literally superficial as the color of their skin, that tells you nothing about the inner worth of that person, then how can it be right to treat people differently just on the account of the nationality that is written on their papers? Isn't that even more superficial? Can that field in the identity card or the color of a person's passport tell you anything about the inner worth of that person? I don't see how it could. Or can the soil that the person is standing on, on either side of the fence, can it justify treating that person with such a different set of laws? Again, I don't see how it could. There were some dark times in the 19th and the 20th centuries, at the peak of the European colonialism and imperialism eras, that many in the global white elite of the day thought that the nonsense of racism and white superiority were backed up by serious good science of biology. A time will come, and I hope sooner rather than later, that nationalism, the idea that it is okay to treat people with entirely different sets of laws and rights just according to their nation, for whatever that word means, that it will be as discredited and delegitimized as racism is nowadays. The second question, that rises from the evident political segregation of humanity, is how come that even though race is no longer the official criterion for segregation, how come that so many of the world's elite are white? Surely this is not just a coincidence. It is, rather, another good reason to use the term global apartheid, because the current world order is still fundamentally a racist one. Only that, unlike the racism of the colonial age, that was direct and blunt and official, the new racism that governs the world today is hidden by the seemingly innocent division of humanity into supposedly sovereign nation-states. It is hidden also by the fact that within the white states, non-white minorities have, at least legally, the same rights, and the fact that few of them are doing really well. But when we zoom out to the global level, we see that just as the creation of the Bantustans in South Africa did not really liberate the blacks there, but deepened their oppression, 
just as it did not really give them an equal standing to that of the whites, but rather entrenched the segregation that kept them under. So on the global level, the creation of the nation-states across the whole world in the stead of the colonialist empires did not end the rule of the white minority over Earth, but enabled it to continue. It did not mend the racial segregation of humanity, but allowed it to persist. It is the same old racist hierarchy, but under different cover, that is just slightly more sophisticated, but not less cruel, oppressive, or unjust. It's high time we realized that the nation-states are our global Bantustans, whose supreme purpose is to isolate the democracies of the global white elite from the threat of the participation of the non-white majority, of the world's people, the world's demos, the main victims of this senseless and heartless system. And one last thing. The ruling elite will always try to defend and justify their grab on power by saying that the opposite of the rule of their minority is the dictatorship of the majority. These are such nonsense. The answer to global apartheid is global democracy. A federal level of government of humanity, by humanity and for humanity. It means closing the great gap between the global economic integration that we have and the global political integration that we need. Between the West and the rest, the privileged white Europeans and humans as equal citizens of this earthly home that we live on together. It is about time, don't you think?